What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This interview is brought to you by 78 Sports. I'm excited to welcome 78 Sports as a new sponsor of Ahead of the Curve. And if you're a baseball coach and you're not familiar with 78 Sports, then you need to be. The guys at 78 Sports are a full design, supply, and installation team and does it all for baseball coaches and facilities. Whether you're looking to get new hitting mats, replace some L screens, or put up a new batting cage, or even design a brand new indoor facility, the 78 Sports team has you covered for it all. As an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners, 78 Sports is offering special pricing on your order when you mention Ahead of the Curve. Give them a call today at 844-478-TURF to get your order started. You can also check them out on their website at www.78sports.com. That's S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, the number 8, sports.com. On today's show, we have on Kellen Lee, middle skills coach for the San Francisco Giants. Kellen was an All-American baseball player and National Gold Glove winning catcher at UC San Diego. Then he got his master's degree in sports psychology from John F. Kennedy University, got his PhD in performance psychology from Grand Canyon University, and he's currently an adjunct professor for sport and performance psychology with a master's degree program at Holy Names University. So on the show, we start with, where do we start with the mental game? We talk about self-talk, what players need in the dugout, and what do players want more of. You're going to love this episode with Kellen Lee. Kellen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I look forward to our discussion, and I appreciate the invitation uh, to jump on here and uh, talk a little shop, talk a little mental game and and some baseball. No, definitely. I've, I've you know I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while ever since you know we set a date, and I was like, yes, like get to get to have Kellen on and, and talk some <laughs> mental game and some and some practical strategies. But for you know for those listening, you are with the San Francisco Giants and. Uh, so you get to, you know, be a part of a, a very large department. Well, I don't, I don't, large can probably be based on perspective, but larger than what most of our listeners are dealing with. And, you know, taking into account our audience, mostly high school, college coaches, and we're on field coaches, but we, we want to get better at this. And I think that this, you know, the, the last, at least, you know, year or two, especially since the pandemic, we've started to notice how important of a, uh, you know, I, I, I would say thing, but how important of, of, of a thing that the mental game is and how we need to teach it and how do we need to, to, to get better at this. And, and so I would love to know, you know, where do, where do we as on-field coaches start? Now this could be youth all the way up to pro ball, but if we're wanting to, to help with, you know, the, the different things that the players are dealing with, where would you start and, and, and what can we, what can we start with? Yeah, I think um, the, the cool thing about the mental game is, um, from what I've noticed for, from talking to coaches and players is that almost everyone talks about it. They allude to it. They, you know, they discuss the importance of it. Um, and I think what the missing piece there is, well, how, how do we train it? We all know it's important. We right. know it exists. We know it's there. You know, what, what do we like? What next? Like, what do we do now? And, um, in fact, even with our pro guys, one of the first things I ask our, our players and, and coaches uh, is, well, how much do you believe this game is mental? Like put a percentage on it. And I'd say, you know, most, if not everyone is 60% or, or more, sometimes 70, sometimes 80% that they believe the game is mental and which is great. And, and then I follow up with a question, well, well, how much time do you spend training the mental side of the game? And it's almost like blank stares. They look at me like I'm crazy and they go, actually probably close to zero. And, and my, 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 uh, my response to that is like, well, that seems problematic. If we're, we're saying the game is, you know, 70% mental, for example, no and we train nothing, that, that's a huge discrepancy. So that's where I come in. I try to give, uh, you know, our players and our coaches the best way to, to train that 70%. Now, even as the mental skills coach for the, for the San Francisco Giants organization, I would never recommend that we spend 70% of our time training the mental game. But what I am here to say is that we should probably do a little bit more than 0% if the game really is, is, is that, uh, you know, that huge, uh, huge chunk of it is mental. So 
a couple no starter starter strategies that you know I offer coaches or, or that I think coaches can definitely handle is honestly having that conversation up front of how much the game is mental. What do they believe? What do these players think uh, contributes to the mental uh, mental side of the game? And then from there, that's it's a set, it's essentially establishing the baseline of of buy in. And because I get that question a lot, it's like how do you create buy in when you train the mental game? Well right there their answer is their immediate buy-in if they if they right. truly believe the that. game is that much mental uh it's really easy for them to 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 jump in the conversation and you don't really have to sell anything they you know you just sold they sold themselves by answering their own answering your question so um that's just you know a foundational piece but i think a couple more practical ways to think about it for for the listeners and the coaches out there is you know just in general like how I define the mental game is how well you manage yourself between competitive moments. So that could be at bats, that could be pitches, that could be innings, that could be games and how will you manage yourself and what goes into managing yourself are, are your thoughts, your emotions, and what you physically do, your behaviors, your responses, your, your reactions to certain things. Um, and I think a really common thing that I hear along that same vein, again, that with this theme of managing yourself between those competitive moments is, you know, I hear from coaches, hey, control your emotions, which is great. Like that is that is alluding to the mental game and that is getting after the mental side of the game because your emotions can absolutely be, you know, helpful or not helpful uh, on the field. Um, but the thing is to understand is that our emotions come from our thoughts. So we need to start with our, what we're thinking because – what we feel is a direct result of what we think. So first we need to tune into what the players are thinking, ask them what's going through their head, you know, literally ask them, Hey, when you're stepping in the box last at bat, like what, what was going through your mind? What, what, what were you thinking about? And then from there, sometimes they don't even know until you ask and bringing that awareness to what, you're, what they're thinking about could be the, the next step for, to them to, to better control their emotions. Because as coaches, it's much easier to see what they feel versus hear what they think. So we need to tune into what they think first so that we can That's help good. them manage those emotions. Um, and I think like, like I said, that phrase control your emotions is pretty common because as coaches, that's what we see. We see the emotional response versus what we actually, what the player is actually thinking, but what they're thinking is most important. So that is just one way to, to flip the script a little bit. And if the end result is to have the player manage their emotions, have them start with their thoughts and just tune into what sure. they're thinking um, so by simply that, asking that question. Would that be uh, considered self-talk uh, in the in the psychological world? Yeah, absolutely. What what okay. you're saying to yourself, what you're saying in general. Um, sometimes you're not saying anything to yourself. Your 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 internal dialogue is about the game or about the umpire or about the other team or about your coach, and and sometimes we're not even attuned to what we're thinking because our thoughts come so fast. You know, the, the analogy I use is, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of people out there that watching uh, all the listeners are watching sports center. Right. And you, and you're, and you're seeing the ticker on the bottom of the screen, a bunch of random stories of, you know, the scores from last night or, you know, a breaking news story of like a big free agent getting signed somewhere. And on, a lot of times those, those, those news stories at the bottom are really random. They're kind of all over the place, but they're continuously going as you're watching the show. That's the same way our mind works is we can have so many random thoughts just ro rolling on a ticker at the bottom of our screen, so to speak. And sometimes we just need to push the pause button and go and take a step back and go like, all right, what are my thoughts here? What am I thinking? Are they helpful? Are they not helpful? Are they productive or counterproductive? And see where I can you know improve or a lot of times just, you know, Hey man, something's working for me. I got to make sure I tune into that a little bit more. So yeah, absolutely. That self-talk is huge. And, and just starting that baseline level of awareness of what they're thinking and how it's impacting them is really, really big. I love that. So, you know, me being a teacher and a, a coach as well, I'm thinking, you know, that I immediately go to, okay, I love the strategy. Now, how do I teach it? And I know some coaches will have access to classrooms or, have access to, you know, different things, uh, for, for the, at their disposal, but like, what would you, how would you progress from there? So you ask them about, Hey, what percentage of the middle game is for you? Uh, would you have them like track their thoughts throughout a day? Or I, I'm just trying to think of how do we get them more aware of the things that they're saying in their minds after we introduce the concept and how important it is? 
Yeah, th- that's a that's an excellent question, and I think there's there's a lot of ways you can do this. So um, you can you can have a you can have a conversation. You know, you don't even have to have a, a classroom or even an office setting to to engage in this discussion. You know, you could be just getting done throwing front front toss flips to a player, and you know, just take an extra one or two minutes to go like, hey, like what were you thinking going into that drill? Or, hey, you're about to step into the box in a game for four ABs or whatever it might be. What do you ideally want to be thinking so that they could proactively almost pre-plan a thought versus letting their thoughts be to chance? That's a really quick way to be more intentional on purpose um, and productive with your thinking if you just plan it ahead of time. Because as we know, our mind can be really random. It can go to a lot of different places. So Sometimes they just need to first understand what they're thinking and then second, what they would ideally like to be thinking in the future so that they can pre-plan it. And then when they get to that competitive moment, they're, be- they're able to, to, to execute because they've managed themselves. Again, back to that definition of the mental game of how well you manage yourself between those competitive moments. So they've managed sure. themselves well by being aware. And then when they get to the competitive moment, they can compete better. So, um, that, that is, that is one way to do it. But like you said, you can have them track their thoughts. You could have a journal, you can, you know, have, you know, jot it, jot down what, what's going on through their head. Um, but first and foremost, just in start engage in that conversation and almost send them away with a challenge of, Hey guys, like, I want you to really tune into what you're thinking and, and just pay more attention to what's working and what's not, um, when you're competing and you'll be surprised at the level of self-awareness that they can gain really quickly just by understanding their thoughts. No, really good. And, you know, I, I am not even close to digging into the mental game and, and the psychology behind it as much as you are. But I, it, going back to when Trevor Moad was still with us, that was one of the things that truly resonated with me of like, keep it simple. Like the, the first thing that he did with Alabama, the Alabama football team was stop saying stupid stuff out loud and yeah. just understanding the, the words and the, and the things that you tell yourself and, and the power that it brings. And I truly love that. I, I don't, I don't know if, if Trevor has had an influence or if you are familiar with his work or not, Absolutely. but I, I know that from a, from a practicality standpoint, that meant a lot to me, but what, what are some other, you know, I, I don't want to say popular things, but what are some other things that, that the players truly enjoy digging more into, or they feel like that, that has helped them uh, more than other things. And, and just t- sticking on the practicality side of things, again, knowing your audience, what were some other ones that you really liked that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one, again, and more of like a, a common theme that I notice across coaching in general, or, or things that coaches provide to, to players frequently is that, you know, I hear like, hey, you need to focus. Hey, you need to focus, focus. And there's no doubt that focusing is important. I would say it's arguably one of the most important things when it comes to, to, you know, consistent, you know, high level performance, but what's key in taking it to the next level is, and what, what players have given feed, me feedback on is it's helpful when coaches tell me what to focus on, why it's helpful and how to focus on it, as opposed to just to leave it at this blanket statement of, Hey, you just need to focus better. It's like, well, sometimes the players truly don't know what they should focus on why it's even helpful or relevant and how to actually do it. So taking that next step and, and, and seeing what you or taking a look at from a coach's standpoint, like what, what are you telling the players to do? What are you telling your athletes to do and how can you help them get to that end result of where you want them to go? Um, and, and again, that that's a really simple way of thinking about it. And it's honestly really hard to do as a coach. If you really reflect back and go like, well, what do I want them to focus on? why am I telling them to focus on and how can I help them do it? That that's taking coaching to the next level. So I think from a practicality standpoint, I think everyone has the capability. All coaches have the capability of taking that next step. It's really identifying your intention of the coach. your in, from the coach's standpoint and you know, what you're trying to accomplish with, with that feedback that you're giving and how you can help that athlete achieve, you know, your, and your desired end result, if that makes sense. Sure. No doubt. You know, I, I think a lot of the stuff that I refer back to is probably Trevor Moad or mm-hmm. we'll go back to Ken Revisa or Harvey Dorfman and some, just some different things that I think those, the, the, the latter two are probably the, you know, who most would consider the godfathers of, of a uh, sports psych in baseball. And they talked even about like one of the biggest ones was the red, green and yellow light system of understanding how much your emotions are 
taking over and how to get back into green lights. And, and I, I think that that one is a really practical one. I, is that one that, that you guys use or is, is something similar of emotional regulation, like you mentioned with self-talk, but how do we, how do we get guys back into, you know, what Kendra Revisa would talk about green lights and, and things like that? Yeah. I mean, all, all of those guys you listed off have been incredibly influential in my career and, and across the, you know, across the, the world of sports psychology and in baseball and, you know, not even just isolated to baseball. They've been incredibly influential on a lot of my, my colleagues and, 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 and people across the field. So I, I'm, I'm glad you gave them a shout out because they're, they're unbelievable. Um, I, yeah, I think the, 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 the red, yellow, green light is a, is an excellent strategy and just a great way to, to provide, like a, a really tangible way of looking at emotional regulation. Um, Cause like I alluded to earlier, like we just need to manage our thoughts better so we can manage our emotions better. And, you know, if they, if they, if the players can see like, Oh, well I'm in a yellow light or I'm, 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 I'm approaching that red light state right now, giving them, giving them the specific strategies to get to green or, you know, on the, on the higher end of yellow, so to speak. Um, is, is, is a cool experience to do and really navigating that conversation with each player is, is a fun way to, fun way to, to, to spend an afternoon uh, on this job. So, um, and some of those strategies uh, that, you know, there's a wide range of strategies to get yourself to green, but, you know, doing some, doing some really solid breath work, some diaphragmatic breathing is a really easy one that a lot of players tend to utilize um, using a focal point, looking at something, you know, on their glove or on their hat, um, or around the field tends to, to help them stay grounded and, you know, be able to regulate that emotion. Um, but also, like I said, just, you know, tuning into their thoughts, pre-planning a thought ahead of time uh, could also get after, you know, getting themselves to green or, you know, a higher level of, of, of functioning, so to speak. Um, but it really all starts out with that self-awareness piece. It's, it's so critical. Cool. No, I, I love hearing that. And uh, I just, I, I know that that was, you know, something that, that was really, you know, kids want to latch on to simple and they want to latch oh, yeah. on to something that's tangible. And you mentioned the focal point. And the only thing that I can think about when I hear focal point is the E60 that Evan Longoria did like, uh, man, I don't even know how long ago that was. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that one or not, but he talked about yes. uh, the, the foul pole, like the foul pole being something like a focal point that he goes to and it grounds him. And uh, I just remember hearing that and I was like, oh man, like that, that makes way too much sense. It's something that's there or that's always at a baseball field. And it's something that I can grab a hold, a hold of and get me back centered at the, at the present moment. And I think that, you know, that's, that's a, that kind of those just, if we could regulate self-talk and we could get our emotions in check, the two that you've mentioned, I think we've pretty much accomplished a, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of what kids are dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to, to think about something that's not important or not relevant to what you're doing. Um, so again, I, I just something popped in my head as we're, as we're discussing another really easy um, and popular strategy to get people locked in on that present moment is just uh, the acronym win what's important now and asking yourself, well, what is important right now? And then likely the answer to that question is probably where you need to, to shift your focus to. Um, so it's really easy. Like, like I said, the, the acronym win W I N what's important now, um, helps just cue an athlete to, to get to where they need to be. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, before I started working with the giants, I, I did some consulting with some, with some colleges and I was working with a, uh, a college soccer player and, you know, she was telling me that she was having trouble focusing or, you know, really, uh, being really easily distracted. So we, I talked through the strategy of win, talked about how it's used. And from that day forth on her, on her wrist tape that she'd wear, she'd write the acronym win. And every time she'd look down at her hand, like during the soccer game, it was a quick reminder of like, all right, what well, I need to bring my attention to what's important now. And she said it was incredibly helpful just to keep her, you know, locked in on what she needed to do to be, you know, really effective on the field. No, I love hearing, you know, the different strategies from especially players when when the players latch onto it and it's something that they can they can go to during the middle of a game. I think that that's obviously uh, s s more thing. The more of, the, of those things that, that we've got in our bag, uh, the better. One of the other things that I think is really interesting too. Uh, were there any more, you know, uh, pillars or uh, really like like things that so we talked about self-talk? energy and emotion management, or I guess emotion management, not energy management. But 
are there any other ones that are really that you're like, hey, if we're going to get three to five or in this instance, you know, start with two or, or however many that you've got uh, before we move on to like in-game stuff, which is dealing with the, with the moment, are there any things that you would want to teach first uh, so that we could we could bring awareness to it at the at the moments of, of when their emotions are are at an all time high, which is during the game. Yeah, I think um, from just like from a general mindset pillar perspective, um, I think no matter what your circumstances are, you can always learn from your teammates about the game, about yourself. And there's a really old saying that honestly, I'm not a great, I'm not a huge fan of, is you either win or learn. And the reason why I'm not really a huge fan of the, that that concept is I think you can learn no matter what the outcome is. And I think there's a lot of value in taking the time to analyze your wins just as much as you analyze your losses. And that is not done very often where, you know, you walk into a clubhouse after a, a, a win, coaches aren't necessarily taking the time to analyze, well, we, we really did this well and we did this well and we did this well and this is why we won. It was more like, yeah, guys, that we won. That was sweet. It's awesome. That was really cool. Let's do it again tomorrow. But when there's a loss, it's, oh, we didn't pitch very well. Oh, we made too many mistakes on defense. We, you know, made too many base running mistakes. Um, you know, we got caught up in the moment. We, you know, this, that, and the other, where the reasons why you won the list is probably just as long, but we don't take the time to really think about it. And I would always encourage people that no matter what, you can you can reflect and learn. And uh, along that same vein, along that same pillar, is don't rely just on experience to learn. The process of learning and where wisdom really comes from is reflecting on your experience intentionally. Because so often do I hear like, oh, I just need more experience before I can learn. I need more experience before I can get better. And, and that may be true to a certain extent, but it's less about the experience and more about the reflection on the experience that causes you to learn. So what I always encourage people is like, have your intentional reflection process so that you can learn no matter what the outcome. So I, I truly believe that if you just embody a lifelong learner, if I wanted to encapsulate that whole idea into one, always learn no matter what the outcome. And I think that plays right into, you know, the emotional control or in the game, um, you can learn like what emotions are working for you versus what they're not. And, you know, learn, you know, you know what to repeat in the future or know what to change in the future. Um, and I think it's, just, it's so valuable to take just as much time to look at what you did well versus, you know, in addition to what you didn't do well, as, uh, you know, after that game. OK, so one of the I, I do like in, in the education world, they talk about, you know, the forgetting curve and the more time that goes on, the more you forget it. And so one of the things that, that I was trying to figure out a good way to do this, and, and you can help me with this if you don't mind, or I'd love it if you could, is trying to find a practical way to, for them to be able to reflect either after practices or after games, which doesn't take a, a lot of time. And so people had talked about journals or, you know, just, I, I'm just trying to find, so I've got, you know, we've got 13 to 18 year old kids. And immediately after the game, once we're done talking with them, they want to get on their phones and then they want to go be social again because we've grabbed their attention for two to two and a half hours or more. So I would love to hear what's a way that maybe you could recommend or, or that you've done in the past or that you know that is quick, but it allows some reflection and allows them to get better and remember it. But it doesn't take, you know, 15 to 20 more minutes of their time after games. Yeah, I think that that is a that's a common challenge uh, to to tackle. Of you know, how can we manage their time? Um, how can we can how, how are we going to add anything to to take away from what they need to do? Whether that's you know, hang out with their family, right. rest, right. recover, all that good stuff. So I think the the biggest thing I would recommend is identify what you would want them to reflect on more specifically and give them the, the strategy to do so. And it can honestly be as simple as like a yes, no question. So um, in fact, I was working with one of our players on this a couple of weeks ago, and he was, he was asking me very similar question to what you just asked me as well is like, how can I do better reflection like in game and a post game? So he was thinking about like after each at bat, like some type of process to reflect, um, you know, to get after that, that, that forgetting curve, what you're talking about. So what we did is we just brainstorm, you know, four or five questions that tends to, to help him learn and move on to the next at bat. Sim something simple as like a yes, no question of, did I stick to my routine between pitches? Yes or no. 
Um, did I try to think what we came up with? Um, uh, did I stay disciplined to my plan during that at bat? Yes or no. Um, and then did anything take me out of my game? Yes or no. If yes, you know, list out what it was so that they can bring attention to what pulled their attention away uh, from, from their particular process and the routine that they've established. And something like that very simply can be done in a minute or two, but it's really going to take some thought and some pre- like some prep work on, on the coach's part, but in collaboration with the players on what do we want to reflect on and how can we make this a really efficient process and still get something out of it. So, you know, of course, like you can sit there and journal for 20 or 30 minutes and get a lot of your thoughts out, but is that practical? I don't know. Most people would say no. So coming up with just some quick hitters, you know, yes, no questions, maybe one or two free response where they can jot down bullet points or something like that just to get their thoughts out there and revisit it later. Um, Because some people, you're going to get some pushback when it comes to journaling. Players are going to go, I don't want to do that. It's a waste of my time. So meeting them halfway and and coming up with a creative strategy uh, to get after the same concept of reflection and learning, because I think that's so, so important, so important, like I said, um, and I think it's definitely doable. Um, you just have to take some time to think like, what, what do I want them to reflect on? What, what do I want them to think about and, and make it as, as simple and as accessible as possible. No doubt. And you know, there there's, I've had conversations with coaches in the past and the, you know, I don't know if you have heard this or not, but what keeps coming up is, well, if they want it bad enough, then they'll you know, they'll do it. And, and that's that, you know, that's true, but for maybe 10% of the players that we work for, I'm sure, or work with, even in your instance, you have your, you know, your 10% of elite guys that are going to truly have success with, you know, with, with baseball, uh, with or without us, you know, we, we feel like we could make an impact, but we are never, ever going to make or break their career. And then you've got like this, you know, this, this, I don't want to say they call it the mountain of average, but you've got like a, you know, 60% or so. And, and these percentages are just, you know, guidelines don't, don't take me to it, but you've got this, <laughs> yeah. this, this group of people who are so similar in just about everything that they're doing, that if we can help a few of them to level up, then it would potentially change their careers, but we do have to get buy-in from them. And, you know, I, I just, I, I want to hear your thoughts on that of like, how do like you, like you mentioned, we, we want to get them hooked, but we also, it, it's just this balance of, you know, yes, the elite guys are going to do what they need to do <laughs> with or without us, but where we, where we make the biggest impact on the guys that, that we can truly get g- to gravitate towards the the foundations and the, the stuff that truly matters and, and really hook them. And it sounds like, you know, letting them have some choice in the matter of even what they're saying after the games has made a big impact w- with where you're at. And I love that idea. Yeah, I think um, that that what you just said is spot on. Like having get allowing them the opportunity to to contribute to their process, and I just the message I send to players is I just want to be a form of help. Whether I'm helping you every day or once a week or once a month, it really doesn't matter to me. It, it, I just want to be a source of help in their career, um, and whether that's you know, sending them a quick reminder on, on game day or, you know, when I'm, when I'm in the dugout, provide them, you know, something they've asked for or something we've talked about. Um, but it's really, it's really up to them. I put the ball in their court. I make sure that they know I'm available and and willing to, to help in any way that I possibly can. Um, and if I can't, I'll find the right person that can. And, and, and I do communicate that. Well, I, I establish my, you know, my lane, so to speak, and I go like, Hey, this is where I can live. If, if you need something else, I'll find the answer for you or I'll find the person for you. Um, but really I think that buy-in is a byproduct of just the constant availability, um, the constant depositing into our relationship bank account, so to speak, where I, I, you know, every, every interaction I have with them, um, I just want to be a great experience for them. And then they know that I, I'm reliable and trustworthy. Um, and, and I think that buy-in is, is a, is a byproduct of that, you know, there's that, that age old saying that I am a fan of, uh, you know, people don't care what you know until they know, they know what you care. And I, and I truly believe that. And, um, you know, cliches are a thing for a reason. Um, sure. cause it's true. It's true. You know, a lot of days, you know, you know, my job title is mental skills coach, but there are days where I might not, I do very little mental skills and more of just like relationship building. And that's, that's a huge step in the right direction in terms of building that trust and the buy-in of what I'm about and, you know, mm-hmm. how I can help them. So 
yeah, I think, you know, it's just, you know, that that's very abstract and, and sometimes hard to, hard to establish in a short pe- period of time. Sometimes you have to be patient for that process to, to come to fruition, but there's just so many, it can pay huge dividends to have that really great relationship with the, with the players. No doubt. Well, and the, the mental skills that we've talked about, not only transcend baseball, that just about anything that, that they're going to do in life, they're going to have to deal with. <laughs> so, Cause me, me as a dad deals with self-talk probably more than myself as a coach, you know, and, no, no and, doubt and about that. especially as a husband and, and, and you know, a, a, again, a, a, as a dad for sure. But with, uh, with that, I, I would love to know. So you've got, uh, we, we've laid the foundation of some different, you know, practical ways to teach and some of the, some of the pillars that you really, really like, but I want to know what do players want in the dugout? Because we don't, you know, we let, let's say we're in the middle of competition and we don't have, <laughs> there are some players who, that don't want to be taught a lesson. They just want to be reminded or, or helped in the moment. And when I put this question of in dugout needs, what do players need during the game? Because again, we, 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 we don't have time to teach an entire lesson, but we can teach in sound bites if that makes sense. So I would love to hear, you know, your thoughts on what do players want during the middle of the game, whether it's between at bats or reminders between pitches, anything along the lines of helping them to, to overcome and, and combat during competition. I would love to hear more of. Yeah, this is a this is a super fun topic um, because because of that reason, it's almost unknown. You know, there's there's so many variables to to do what's quote unquote right. And I'd say like the the one principle that I think is consistent, no matter what your approach is, is you have to have feel. You have to understand the situation. You have to have that situational awareness. You have to understand that other that person, that player you're about to approach. Um, or even in my role, you have to, I have to understand the coaches. If I have something to say to a coach in the dugout, I have to understand like there's a time and place to do it. Am I, am I going to, you know, grab the pitching coach when we're pitching? Probably not. If I am, I going to grab the hitting coach while we're on offense? Probably not. So you have to have that feel. So in, in general, everyone is unique player and coach alike. Um, and they all have unique needs and, Sometimes just preparing yourself for that conver- those conversations pri- much, much before, way prior to the game uh, can set you up for success. So um, and, and one thing to remember is like sometimes doing quote unquote nothing is actually doing quote unquote something. And I want people to understand that because sometimes just your presence being there um, can can be can make a difference. And that feedback has been given to me as well of, you know, hey, Kellen, like I saw you in the dugout and. It just reminded me of a conversation we had a month ago and it just got me back like where I needed to be. And it was, and I literally did nothing. I had no idea that happened. I wouldn't have know, known that even happened unless the player came up to me later and told me about it. Um, and uh, which was really cool. So um, a couple specific examples I can give you in terms of d- dugout needs is, you know, from the Please pitching side, for the pitching side, like some pitchers want to debrief their outing immediately. They want to do it like, they come off the mound, they, you know, go put their glove down, they get a drink of water, you know, they get a, a you know, some seeds or whatever they got to do. And some people will just will come right up to me and go like, all right, Kellen, like this is what was going on in my head. This is what took me out of my routine. Um, this I thought was a great adjustment that I made, you know, was it rather as physical and mental. Honestly, I don't really care what they talk about, but because they're going through that reflection process um, and I'm just a pair of ears willing to listen and, you know, throw in my feedback here and there. So, um, what I do is I get with, when I go visit an affiliate, um, I'll get with the the starting pitchers and I'll go like, all right, guys, like, what do you need from me? You know, if it's nothing, that's fine. If you want to debrief your outing after, that's great. I'm here. Um, you know, the bullpen guys, hey, I'm going to make it. I'm going to probably me- meander my way down to the bullpen at some point during the game. You know, what do you need from me? Do you want, you know, just to keep it nice and loose and relaxed down there? You know, does someone want to talk shop? Like, you just tell me. So I can be ready and have that feel, like I said, it's that situational awareness uh, as to what they need. Um, some, like I said, some pitchers want to break it down the day of. Um, some guys want to do it the, the day after, um, and ju- they just know that I'm always available to break it down. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there on the rail by myself, just enjoying the game. They'll come up, hey, Kellen, you got a sec, and I'll come like, dude, I got all day for you, man. Like whatever you need, I'm here. This is why I'm in the dugout, uh, providing the support. So um, that's pitching side. 
Uh, on the position player side, uh, it's a little bit more dynamic in that obviously a position player is going to get a handful of at-bats if they're in the starting lineup. Um, so sometimes – Sometimes as a, as a group, when I go out and visit an affiliate, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some mental game shot before the game when, you know, in their pregame meeting. Um, sometimes we won't, but sometimes they'll, they'll just come find me during the game, whether they're hitting or in the lineup or not. And just like remind me of what we talked about, which honestly I think is them just reminding themselves of what we talked about. And, you know, I'll course correct them if necessary or send them on your way. Like, Hey man, you sound like you're locked in. You don't need me today. Get out of here, you know, make a quick joke with them and send them on their way. Um, also another, you know, variation of the position player side is some guys want to talk to me like after they're at bats, you know, maybe the next half inning when they're sitting there after defense and, you know, they'll come like, Hey, Kellen, like I got something, man. Like I noticed I was, you know, trying to do too much or, you know, thinking too much when I'm in the box, you know, I got to make that adjustment for the next at bat. And even if I don't give them anything, sometimes them just talking about it will help them refocus and relock in for that next at bat. Like you said, I, maybe I don't even need to give them a lesson or teach them something new. Sometimes they just need to externalize it so that they hear it themselves and go like, well, well, that's ridiculous. I need to make an adjustment or they'll go like, well, shoot, that was really effective. Maybe I should try that again. If they had a really good at bat or they're seeing the ball well, they, you know, stuck their approach or really disciplined in the zone. Um, all those things are great and, and, and important for them to remember. And sometimes I'm just a pair of ears willing to listen. So um, and also like some guys want to be left alone. So I know that too. And I, I let them do their thing. And, you know, maybe the, the next day I'll, 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 uh, I'll follow up with them if I have some feedback for them. Um, but you just have to have, you just have to have feel, you have to understand the situation, understand the person and understand that you're probably not going to have an entire game to give them a lesson, um, unless they're not in the game, <laughs> because sometimes right, I've had great conversations sure. with guys on the bench, you know, watching the game and, you know, them reflecting on a pre like a, a recent game or, um, you know, a pitcher that's off that day, you know, getting ready for their next start, something like that. You know, it, it's so it's so cool um, just to be in the dugout, you know, being able to enjoy a ball game, which I think most of the listeners uh, would, would agree is awesome, but also have those really important conversations about what they're thinking, what, you know, tuning into what's working for them. Um, no and I get to, I get to live that every day. It's, it's pretty awesome to, to be that 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 source of support for the guys i love that and i will i'll share a short story and then i I, i've got a question for you the first one was i you know having some feel in a dugout and especially when guys are getting out one of the things that i think really good teams do and you know i i got the got the opportunity to be on a state championship high school state championship team this year and offensively we had a good year and a lot of that is, you know, we had good players, but we also, I thought that they did a great job of communicating, you know, what, what pitchers it, it felt like in the box. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I, I, you, you have some guys that get, you know, who need a minute and you have some guys who want to come over and talk. And one of the, one of the questions, cause you know, inevitably no matter what or how long the season is, you're going to have guys that struggle. And when you, when you have a stretch, you know, when you, especially in high school, when you go two for 10 or, or oh for 10 or, or two for 15 or whatever, like that's, that's a quarter of their at bats sometimes. And so one of the things that, that I started asking them, especially, you know, guys that, that needed a more of a minute, I would say, Hey, uh, when you get a minute, come talk to me instead of like, you know, they just had a terrible at bat. They just punched out on three straight fastballs right down the middle. Like, instead of trying to grab them immediately, they're already mad and embarrassed that, I, I would either go wait till they got their gloves off or and that was the thing of like, Hey, when you take your gloves off, come see me. Or just when you get a minute, come see me. And I, I thought that was super helpful to just, it put it in their court, but it also, they knew that I was paying attention and I might've had something for them or at least wanted to let them get some stuff off of their chest. But that was something that really worked uh, for us. And then the, the second question that I had was, what questions do you like to ask in a dugout that you know will get good answers? Because, you know, I, I always go back to, you know, what are you seeing? What do you feel? Or, uh, you know, what what is X, Y, or Z? And j- just trying to put the ball in their court of, of what they're seeing with, when it's going on because I can't. I'm in the dugout. Uh, but those are, you know, some defaults, and then you can insert pitcher's name or you can insert, hey, what's this hitter? Like, you know, what a lot of them play against each other, which you, the players that you work with do as well. But I'd love to hear more questions that get good answers to talk about the game uh, in a dugout yeah well first of all i think um 
that strategy that you just talked about of like, Hey, come find me when you're, when you're ready or, you know, just throwing it out there and just opening up the door for them to start that conversation, I think is, is, is huge. And I, uh, I might borrow that one if, uh, if I have something for a guy who, uh, is, uh, is a little upset or just, you know, caught up in the moment and, and I know I can help them, you know, immediately or for the next at bat. I think that that's a really cool strategy. Um, yeah, questions I like to ask in the dugout. I think this is this is a cool discussion. So, um, I like to ask um, what I what I would phrase as like this or that questions or like scaling questions, and and I'll describe describe a little bit what I'm talking about. So, like this or that questions are giving them give, posing a question where there's really not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but co- stimulating enough thought in them where they can articulate. And be more aware of what they believe. So a perfect example that I like throwing out there is, is it more important to focus on your strengths or focus on the opponent's tendencies? And that tends to spark a lot of great like conversation lot. where they're like, well, and it, sometimes it c- catches them off guard. And again, this is a situation, again, talking about have and feel. I'm not going to ask that guy, ask that to a guy who's about to go hit and three hitters. Like that's just, that's a bad timing for that. But if I, if I'm sitting there next to a guy who's not in the lineup or a starting pitcher who's not throwing that day, like those are the kind of questions that I love sparking thought, because like I said, there's really not a right answer, but it gives them insight and gives me insight as to where they're coming from. So um, that, that tends to be helpful. Um, A scaling question. Um, tends to be like a, hey, from one to 10, uh, you know, a perfect example, from like one to 10 in general, how motivated are you on a daily basis? And let's just say they have, a, let's just say they seven, eight, or whatever, or how confident are you on a daily basis, just in general, one to 10, one being none, 10 being the most confident you can be. And then you go, okay, well, how about today? Like right now, what's your level of confidence? And, and if there's a discrepancy there, let's just say they're generally a seven and that today they're a five. You can actually dive deeper into, well, what, what is causing that discrepancy? Like what threw you off? Was it yesterday? Was it something today? And you can have them tune into sp- the spe- the specifics of what, what tends to, to alter or impact or influence their confidence level. So you, right there, you dive into, you first establish the baseline that there there is a baseline level of general confidence that they have, whether it's high or low is honestly not really that important. What's most important is that there's a discrepancy. But if there isn't, if they happen to say the same number twice, you're like, well, shoot, like what's helped you stay consistent at the, at that confidence level? Or how can you look to increase it? You know, something like that. And, and then it really gets them thinking about where their confidence comes from, how they build it, how they sustain it. Um, and stuff like that. So again, my, my two go-tos are like that this or that question where, you know, there's really not a right or wrong answer just to s- spark some thought, but, or give them like something like a scaling question where you ask them, you know, from one to 10 or, you know, one to five or whatever yeah, it might be, cool. depending yeah. on what you're asking, um, tends to be really helpful in sparking those conversations. Yeah, that was, that was another one that, that I stumbled upon somehow this year of, you know, give me one to 10, where's your energy level? like for the situation because some guys would play way too high and then they would get, you know, they'd be football players or linebackers playing, <laughs> trying to hit. And it's like, Oh man, yeah. we need to scale it down a little bit. Or, you know, it, it, even as a team of like, Hey, where, where are we at on one to 10 of, of where we, where are we and where, where do we need to be? Where do we need to be sitting? And that was helpful too. It just, again, it, it, it attaches it to a tangible thing of, of it, it, it's very, you know, it's very context specific and it may change, a, a million times, but it, but it's something that they, they, it, they have to think about it and they have to go, okay, yeah, I play best at X and I'm at Y. So now I need to make up the difference in one way or another. Uh, really, really good. Cause you know, with, especially with teenagers, some of these open questions, it's like, they may get back to you in a week with some of these answers, which <laughs> if it's not helping you win a game and it's, it's a long-term development thing, then that's good. But if you yeah. want them to ramp down the energy levels or ramp up, I, I, I really, really like, uh, you know, make giving them questions that they, that they can answer and get them rolling in, in regards to that. But with, with, you know, these questions that we're asking, you know, you get to see a side of these players that on field coaches may not, there's a different relationship, right? They may feel more comfortable telling you things that they, than they tell the on field coach or vice versa. 
But I would like to know, like from your perspective, what do players wish coaches did more of? Or is there anything that comes up with from your side of things that the players are like, man, I just I wish we did more of X or I wish coaches did less of of Y or is there any constant themes that come up of that, that players that confide in you are like, Hey, I, you know, X, Y, or Z from on-field coaches. Yeah, this, this is a, this is a great, great question. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because um, I've, I've asked players, what, what do you want our coaches to do more of? Um, because I make it clear to them that not only do I work with the players, of course, but coaching coaches is, is a big part of what mental skills is all about. Like, getting coaches up to speed on how they can best coach it. Very similar to what we're having this conversation. Like, you know, having these conversations with the coaches is just about half my job, if not more. Um, so I, I bring that feedback to our coaches and, and a couple of themes that, that I picked up on from our players is they, they would love coaches to ask more questions. And, um, and the reason why is every player has a unique perspective and their, their perspective is important, especially because they're the ones between the lines. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. Like coaches want, want to correct mistakes because that's their job. They want to jump in there. They want to give that feedback. They want to, you know, adjust what needs to be adjusted, which is great. That is a huge component of coaching and a part of effective coaching in my opinion. Right. And, but at the same you know, time, and, go ahead. And with that, and with that, it's, it's out of a, a want to help. Like totally. it's, I, I think sometimes players think that we're trying to, we're constantly on them, but it's, it's where we're, we see a lot of the things that the players are doing that are good and we let it go because it is good, but we focus on the bad because we want to level them up in that area. And I, I I've had a lot of conversations with, with that with players too. So I, did, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I thought that that would be a great addition to, to what you were saying. Absolutely. No, th- thanks for, uh, thanks for jumping in there. I think like, like you said, it is coming from a place of help. Like we want to help as coaches. We want to get in there. We want to adjust. We want to change. We want to get better. Um, but keep in mind that like their, the player's perspective is really important. And, and having that conversation is worth exploring to in- include their perspective in the equation or in the solution of whatever you're trying to solve. So, um, you know, players just want to be invited into that conversation versus being told what to do. They can, you know, have some, um, have some say and, and, and contribute to that plan. Um, Cause ultimately, again, we're, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole, but um, when, it, when someone has a, a sense of, of power or um, autonomy or feel like they have some type of contribution to something, they're more likely to stay motivated to do it. So when you're asking a player to make a change, they're more likely to make that change long-term if they feel like they contributed in some capacity um, and just asking them, inviting them into that discussion about a possible adjustment or a recommendation um, tends to make it stick a little bit longer. Um, yeah, and, agreed. and yeah, like I just, it just, it's, it's huge for these players to feel like, yeah, like I had to say, like it was part of what I wanted. Um, and, and, and then they're more likely to, to implement it long-term is with ultimately what we want these players to do. Um, the second thing that I think players wished coaches did more of, I think is, is, is being honest. Um, sometimes players can, can pick up on the BS meter if a coach is just trying to punch, pump them up to, to feel good. And especially like, I hear this a lot from the, from our pro guys. Like I ask them, I'm like, well, would you rather someone just tell you you're good or tell you what you like, tell you honestly what they see. And I would say over 90% of players are going like, well, I want you to tell me exactly what you see so I can adjust or do again what I'm doing. Um, it, it, they just, they, they want honest feedback so they can learn. And sometimes like we've talked about with feel, sometimes context matters. Sometimes uh, more importantly, how the, the feedback is, is delivered is incredibly important. So even though what you're saying might be accurate and honest, you're like, Hey, I listened to this podcast and this Kellen guy, mental skills guy told me to be honest. Like, I don't understand why they're not listening to me. Sometimes how you say it, well, I would say more so, more often than the, as how you say it, where you say it, uh, in front of who, and and all that context matters. But in general, the principle there is the honesty is ultimately going to gain respect from that player. And there are ways to provide honest feedback that isn't necessarily easy to hear, that still re- uh, keeps that integrity of that relationship that we alluded to earlier really intact. So um, no something doubt. as simple as like, Asking the player, hey, if I have some honest feedback for you, when and where and what and how do you want me to deliver it to you? Very simple, proactive, 
be, you know, ask them where, what, what environment do they, would they recommend or ask them how they would want to hear that honest feedback. But for the most part, like I said, players want to be told, be told honestly what, what they're said and objectively being as objective as possible is huge. So on those same lines, uh, I, I think it was John Gordon. And this is, this is a, this is a quote that I heard like two weeks ago that it's been, you know, battering around in my brain for the last week and a half. But it, I think I, I'm like 99.9% sure it was John Gordon of where he said, where there's a, where there's a silence, there is like un, unsure is going to fill that void or negativity. I, I think he said where there's silence, negativity fills the void. And I, I, Man, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I just, I know that whenever I would rather be told straight up, you know, one thing or another or given feedback that's truly honest than none at all, for sure. And and it's almost like ripping off the Band-Aid, right? You'd, you'd rather have it ripped off than, you you know, than, than, than peeled off slowly. And and I don't know if that analogy still fits, but but that's just one of those things that you talk about, like, with, with that feedback piece. And I heard that quote and I was like, man, like that, that is, that is so good. And it's so true because I don't know if, if you feel like that way, but like my whole life, I've been like, if, where there's a lack of, uh, or where there's silence or lack of communication and clarity, then I honestly go to the, I, I go to the negative place first. Yeah. Ambiguity is really hard to decipher. Um, especially young kids. Again, a lot of listeners, like you said, are, you know, high school or, or sure, young yeah. college, um, if ambiguous information is given to them, it's very hard for them to to fully understand it. And our tendency as humans is to shift to that negative side of it things. So being as clear, being as honest, being as objective and accurate as you can with that feedback, I think is going to eliminate those moments where, well, it's going to minimize the ambiguity, but also minimize the moments where the players are so just confused and they don't really know what you're saying or don't understand what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think everyone wins the more honest, the more direct, the more uh, accurate and objective you can be with your feedback and, and comments that you make to players. No doubt. Well, I got a couple more questions for you okay. and, uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll uh, hit the, hit, hit, hit the road and, and send this one out. And, and, and I, again, I, I want to say thank you before we do that for coming on the show and sharing so much, because it's been, it's been an op uh, an awesome episode. And I don't know if you were a pitching guy or a hitting guy, but I called these quick hitters because usually I'm, you know, I'm a hitting guy. And so, uh, so uh, we'll, for, we'll former, former catcher, I, I, I oh, feel like I'm a, I'm a hybrid. I, I can understand the hitter side, but I understand the pitching side. It's, I call myself a half a pitcher. You know, you're good. I know where your priorities lie. So <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. But what's a, what's a drill? And I, this could be just, just anything in general, but what's like a drill or a, an, an activity or something practical that you, know that your players love they you've introduced it and you've gone through it maybe even with several groups and they've all it's been a hit but is there anything that comes to mind with that that the players truly love to do with you yeah um a really fun one regardless of age i've done this with 10 year olds all the way up to adults in in pro baseball so it's been a fun one so uh, essentially uh i'll have them i'll break them into groups uh, depending on how many people i have and then i'll have them draw a stick figure on their piece of paper. I give them a piece of paper, have them as a group, draw a stick figure, like pretty big. And I'll say, okay, so on your stick figure, I want you to draw all of the physical sensations or changes that are typically associated with nervousness. And, you know, they'll draw the butterflies in the stomach. They'll draw the sweat. They'll draw like a little thought bubble with all the racing thoughts. They'll draw like trembling hands um, you know, all, all the stuff like we tend to as typically associate with nervousness. Right. So, um, so then how I debrief it is I'll go, okay. So I, I'll, in front of the board, if I'm in a classroom, I'll draw a big, big stick figure myself and I'll have the groups contribute like, okay. You know, like I said, butterflies and the, the shakiness in the hands and the trembling and the racing thoughts and the sweating and, you know, the chattering of teeth is another common one. So I'll draw it up there. So everyone sees like the master, um, master, uh, stick figure. And I'll say, okay, well, we're not going to draw, but if I had you draw all the physical sensations or changes that are typically associated with excitement, what would you draw? And every single time the answer is like, well, I draw the exact same thing. I'm like, okay, let's start there. So physically excitement and nervousness are identical. So what determines whether we are excited or nervous? And the punchline there is 
how we think about the physical changes that typically occur. And again, we don't go down, I don't typically go down the rabbit hole of explaining why, but essentially our brain doesn't distinguish between real or imagined threats. And sometimes if we just interpret a threat or a situation differently, it causes us to feel quote unquote nervous and all those physical changes happen. But if we literally tell ourselves, hey, this is really exciting, exciting, or this is my body preparing for something important, more likely than not, we're, we're going to be able to regulate those physical changes and be more in control of our body. But like I started at the very beginning of this conversation, we need to start with our thoughts. So the punchline there to really point the emphasize is that we don't feel nervous because of a situation. We feel nervous because of how we think about the situation and how we think about the physical changes that are happening. And we, if we simply tell ourselves this is exciting or this is something important, are those physical changes tend to regulate a little bit better versus, oh, shoot, I'm nervous because I'm not prepared. That's what happens. Like the physical sensations get worse and worse and worse, and we have less control of our body. So that's a really cool act- exercise, really practical. You can do it in a couple minutes. Um, and then it really hammers the point home that we need to be in control of our, our mind, no matter what our body is experiencing. Wow. I really like that one. That one, consider that one stolen. <laughs> we're, we're all pirates. Go for it. Oh, for sure. Next question <laughs> is what is the latest thing that you've learned that's made you better at your job? Oh man. Um, more Spanish. I'll tell you that. So in, in pro ball, um, for a lot of you that may, may or may not know, you know, almost half of our minor league system are made up of, of players not from the United States and who have very limited English capabilities. So um, I've made it a, a huge point the last couple of years to really hone in my Spanish um, because I truly I have a personal belief of mine. If it's important enough to say to one group of players, it's important enough to, sh- to share with everyone. Um so I've gotten to the point where I can do my job. I can talk mental game. I can, you know, h- help these players who are, you know, Spanish is their first language, native language in their native language. So I've really sharpened up my Spanish skills. Um, you know, and it's really helped me again. My personal belief is I can't be as good at, or as effective in my job unless I can reach everybody. Um, so now I can communicate with everyone about the mental game or, you know, even serve as a translator in the dugout. If players are having a conversation amongst each other, or if a, if a coach needs to be translated into Spanish, I also serve as that as well. Um, and it's really important for me to, to build those connections uh, with everybody out there. For sure. That's a great one. What is the most recent thing that you've changed your mind about and why did you change your mind? Oh, that's a good question. Um, man, can I go with two things? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, one, I would say I had a belief that Jordan shoes are not baseball shoes, but we have a lot of players who just kept, Hey, Callan, you got to get some Jordans. You got, you got to get some Jordans. You got to get some Jordans. Which one? Like "Ah, the Jordan ones. I got some Jordan ones. And, you know, cause I'd see them wearing them, wear them as turfs or some of them had them customized with cleats on the bottom. And I'm like, those aren't baseball shoes. Like they're, they're basketball shoes. Like I, I, so I, you know, I decided to get myself a pair this year to wear on the field and consider me sold. I don't know if I'm going to wear another pair of turfs ever again. Um, Jordans are probably going to be my go-to. Um, and why I changed my mind, I literally just tried it. I didn't, I tried not to knock it before I tried it. Um, and I did it and I'm a believer. Um, yeah, but this the second one's a little bit more serious. First one's a little joke, a little little silly, but um, like I, I I always believed that you had to be moving or doing something to be like progressing. Um, but I realized that some of the best progress that I've made and some of the best progress that I've witnessed other people make are when they're they're just still and they're grounded and they 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 know they're so in, engrossed in where they are and what they're doing. Um, that they can be effective. But also with that said, like, you know, this idea of, you know, being still and still making progress of like, they're able to intentionally plan out like purposeful rest and like be really intentional with it instead of just taking sporadic breaks or, or, you know, you know, you know, flipping off, you know, you know, just like flipping off the, the, the computer and the, and the, and the phone for a couple of days, like, 
you don't, I think if you intentionally sporadically implement that restful period, I think you can be really effective. So, you know, I don't think you have to be moving to be progressing. I guess it's the thing that I've most changed my mind about recently. Uh, Cause I always felt like you had to be hustle. You had to hustle all the time. And, but I think there, there is value in like taking a second. Man, I feel like that all the time. So thank you for sharing that. And then the, the final one is share with us a failure and how that's propelled you forward into who you are today. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think a huge failure that for me, it was actually multiple. I, I interviewed with a couple different organizations throughout my career okay. for the same role. And, um, you know, I think how that's propelled me is I just listened to all the feedback and I implemented the best I could. And, um, you know, I'm really happy that, uh, that I ended up, you know, being coachable and, and saturating all the information and using, you know, those experiences to my advantage because I, I couldn't have found a better fit uh, with myself and the Giants. The Giants are an unbelievable organization that, you know, really value what, you know, my, my and our department bring to the table. And um, I'm just, I'm really grateful to, to be where I'm at. So I think uh, it, you know, the, the failures of not getting the, the job, so to speak, early on in the career, um, really propelled me to where I needed to be, which is here. Um, and it was only because I was coachable and, and just really listened to that feedback and, you know, tried to, to implement it as best I could. So um, I, I think it's it. important for everyone to hear, you know, if you don't necessarily get the job you're interviewing for, um, there might be something else later. Uh, if you listen to Very feedback cool. and are coachable, something else might come your way. A great lesson. Well, Kellen, man, I, I've looked, I've been looking forward to getting to know you and I'm so thankful that I got that opportunity today. And uh, let me be the first to say thank you again for coming on the show. But I did want to give you the opportunity to, you know, to share with our listeners anything and everything else that you've got. And I know that's a very in loaded question, but is there anything else that you'd like to share or tell our listeners before you go? Um, I think I just want to reiterate one of the pillars that I said earlier is that, you know, really, truly embodying a lifelong learner is is one of the the best gifts you can give to yourself. Um, and with that said, like, don't limit yourself to what your, you know, your, spe- your quote unquote specialty or you're an expert in already, you know, branch out, expand your horizons, learn more about other fields. I found a lot of value learning about, you know, business psychology or, you know, um, diff- different areas of, of human performance and, and, and just understanding people better. And it's helped me be better at my job. So just continues to learn, you know, no matter what the outcome you can learn. Um, and I think like, you know, I think that's going to serve you no matter whether you, you coach for the rest of your life or you, 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 you make a career change or whatever, whatever your situation is out there as a listener. I think embodying a lifelong learner uh, is one of the best gifts you can give yourself. Thank you so much for listening to Ahead of the Curve. If you would do us a huge favor, leave a rating or review wherever you are listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone and tag us on social media. That would help us so much with growing the show and helping others to stay ahead of the curve.